three legs gone and the next in-port race fast approaching. The Volvo Ocean Race is in Singapore, looking ahead to the Chinese New Year and the challenges that lie beyond. Seven legs now remain. The next, a punishing upwind struggle in sub-zero temperatures to Qingdao in China. One boat will not be taking part. While other crews return from a few days rest away from their boats, Team Russia skipper Andreas Hannekamp prepares to take his to Cape Town. Unable in the current economic climate to find the additional sponsorship they require, Alex Zarepsov's financially troubled campaign has had to withdraw from the next two legs. Well, it's really sad, you know, um, but, you know, you have to be a realist in these lives and, you know, with the times. So, uh, it's, you know, not what we imagined when we started the project 19 months ago, <laughs> that this would ever possibly happen. The 2008-09 Volvo Ocean Race is barely three months old. If the months to come are as eventful as those already gone, it'll be a year to savour. October the 11th, departure day in Alicante. Eight teams left the dock, boats prepared, route researched, weather analysed. The leg one challenge may have been familiar to some of the veterans, but what did they know of each other? Nothing. You know, the people involved, the teams involved, who's got money, who's got two boats, who's been working hard, who the designers are. But really, until they line up next to each other, you don't have a clue. On the Nordic Ericsson 3, the ability of the crew itself was another unknown quantity. I actually remember talking to the lads, like, how many fast nets have you done? They're like, none. And how many Gotland runs have you done? Oh, I've done one. You just really can't. OK, well, we're about to quadruple your uh, offshore experience in the first leg of the race. The start in Alicante was one of the most nerve-wracking uh, sporting adventures I've ever had. All this time, all this effort, all the money, all I could think of was the race start last Volvo, and that was, what, two of the boats blew, blew up the first night, head back to port, and essentially the race is over. One of them was Bauer Beckings, and when Telefonica Blue's steering broke just hours into this race, his new campaign looked to have met the same fate. But after stopping to replace the rudder arms and suffering a 12-hour penalty, Becking's crew was back on its way. Tony's got a bit of an infected knee that we have to drain a lot of pus out, so we've got some good needle action ahead of us this morning. All that was slowing Torben Grail's men on Ericsson 4 was helmsman Tony Mutter's poisoned knee. But the agonising wait to be evacuated proved almost as painful. It would have been the simplest thing in the world to change for me to get off. But as it turned out, it turned into a bit of a debacle where the boat wasn't where it was meant to be and then we had to wait around and it was just, for an hour, it was just terrible. Good luck, Tony. I was at the point where I was just about ready to say, forget it, let's keep going and uh, we'll see, you know, we'll see what happens. first week. I guess it was a relief just knowing, hey, the boat's got legs. My biggest nightmare in life was to work this hard, start a 37,000 mile race and realize that 20 miles into it, you're in a pig. Ian Walker was in a dragon the Green Dragon, and it was his boat that smoked to the scoring gate at Fernando de Noronha in first place. The very moment we went through the gate was chaos because we had a power, we'd lost all our power on board and couldn't swing the keel, and so it took us a while to get organised, but um, no, it was, a, it was a real boost. I think as much as anything for the whole team, you know, all the guys that built the boat and the shore team, as well as those 11 of us on the boat. When Green Dragon slipped back, Ericsson 4 and Puma fought for the lead in a protracted dispute that tested the patience of both the crews. How many 
miles that we sailed to get away from them and they finally jive. Good riddance. Go away. Go away. So just trying to make our decision now on uh, when we turn left and head towards Cape Town. When the winds picked up, only one boat was left in contention. As the rest of the fleet backed down, Ericsson 4 stepped up, a record and sailing renown in the offing. I turned into one of the uh, internet junkies following the race, which is, so I got to see it from the public side, and uh, it's hard work getting, you know, every three hours going for the skids. see that they were pretty close to doing it so actually I sent a text out to a few people um, to Richard Bresius and uh, Juan Kay just to let them know that said to them you know today fellas are uh, probably going to break a 24-hour record and it could be very close to 600 miles just so you know so you know sure enough within two hours when it came back that they'd done it good to see Covering 596.6 miles in 24 hours at its peak, Ericsson Falls pace proved too hot for opponents to handle, including its closest pursuer. We hadn't done a lot of that type of sailing at all. Not hard downwind stuff, but yeah, disappointed. But you know, we conceded straight away there and there in the first place. But I, we couldn't have, I don't think we could have done it anyway, so it's good on. Seeing Ericsson 4 uh, flying away from us, it I have to say it was pretty painful and it's still pretty painful now uh, because it clearly shows that they are strong and it shows as well our weakness. To be precise, we are missing uh, handsmen on board at that level and when the conditions become critical you need special skills. More serious were the shortcomings exposed on the Telefonica boats. Rudder failure sparked a damaging sequence of events on Telefonica Black while the crew of their sister ship was also in for a nasty surprise. It's, it's certainly a case that we didn't do a lot of big downwind sailing because we got the boats in the summer. We're based in the Mediterranean and uh, yeah, we, had, we had very little time to go elsewhere. So uh, the sort of big, big downwind stuff, the sort of sail development wise, we were pretty happy with what we were going to get. So we, we kind of assumed it would be all right, I guess. And uh, yeah, the, the first day came as a big shock to us. So we couldn't keep the bow up. It was very difficult for us to surf a wave, punch the next wave, and try to keep going. Well, like, we saw Ericsson 3 passing us like a power boat, so it was a big uh, four guys on deck. We were, at that time, we were six on deck, and we couldn't keep up. And our training base in Lanzarote there, we knew what she was capable of. We'd had her out and. At least once a week we were sailing in 30 plus knots in the boat, but uh, to be honest with you, we'd go out and sail like that for an hour and a half and get back on the dock and we'd all be exhausted. That last bit coming into Cape Town there, that was some of the most brutal sailing I've ever done. Arriving in Cape Town half a day ahead of their nearest rivals, Ericsson 4 looked untouchable. Well resourced and well prepared, Torben Grail's men had delivered. Well done, mate. Yeah. Awesome. For Ken Reed on Puma, making Cape Town and the podium was an altogether more emotional affair. Everything kind of came down in one, at one time. We finished on a Sunday evening. There was a million people down there by the water. There's lights everywhere. All of a sudden, there's a fireworks display going off. We're coming into the dock. There's thousands of people. It's like, wow, you know, this is what we do this for. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Oh. After the frantic rush to make the start line in Alicante, Delta Lloyd made changes in Cape Town. Owner and skipper Jer O'Rourke wasn't happy with eighth place. And when he left on business as expected, his ambitions for the team remained. There were some rumors that changes could be in the works, and, but it was a little bit of a surprise when we got to Cape Town, exactly who was on the boat, who was off the boat. And it's just the thing about professional sports, there always is a guy waiting to take your spot, so um, it's probably inevitable in the sport, and you know, who knows, there might be changes down the pike. 
third to arrive in Cape Town, but demoted to fourth because of their uncompliant keel. And as Luanda's crew on Ericsson 3 received a further blow as they prepared to depart. Cape Town, for a start, it's hard to leave that place. It's just fantastic. Uh, but, um, you know, we'd been through an entire race before we even got back to uh, being under Table Mountain and, and having to sail away from there. We'd used every sail on the boat in 40 minutes. For the first time, Leg 2 took the fleet northeast across the Indian Ocean, not south into the southern. A profound change, some argue, to the very nature of the challenge. They needn't have worried. Two days in, an old-school hammering hit the fleet and the inexperienced crew on Ericsson 3. The nice thing with the Nordic guys is they don't know when they're pushing it too hard because they've never done it before, so you can sort of lead them into a little bit like, then they look at you and it's like, it's good, yeah, no, no problem. You sort of look the other way. <laughs> it's good they don't know. Yeah, so, um, but we did 39.7 uh, knots in that leg. That's crazy. Another early addition to the casualty list was Green Dragon, its boom broken in the teeth of a 50-knot squall. Team Russia's hopes were knocked sideways in a vicious Chinese jibe. And Puma's Il Mostro suffered two separate fractures of its hull, forcing Ken Reed's men to throttle back in their pursuit of the leaders. Carbon cracking noise is a sound you just can't miss. You break one thing and all of a sudden, bang, 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 all of a sudden five other things are broken. You know something seriously has gone wrong when you hear those sort of bangs. And things may be broken with carbon fiber that you don't even know about. You can't see, you haven't heard. We actually remedied the problem pretty well, but uh, we couldn't, you know, we lost miles that we couldn't get back. Just as Telefonica Blue's speed in lighter winds looked like threatening leg leaders Ericsson 4, they too were slowed by damage, this time to a dagger board, and to the navigator's intense irritation. We knew we were really quick in those conditions, and, and you know, we were all rubbing our hands together going, great, you know, this is 2,000 miles of pressed up reaching, we're going to be super quick, and we're going to be, you know, with any luck, we're going to be right up to the front of the fleet with this, and uh, yeah, in, in just 14 knots of wind, the dagger board broke for, for whatever reason. And, yeah, it was, it was terribly frustrating because all of a sudden from going being competitive you, were, you knew you were just back to hanging in there again, so no, it, it was hard, but I guess in the end it turned out to be a bit of a blessing in disguise. The crew's predicament forced them further west than they'd intended, but ultimately within range of second place. Initially our, our hand was forced there and then because we were more west, it pushed us even more west with the, with the shift we got, but but certainly when we were in there and we'd had the hand we'd been dealt, I think, I think we did a nice job, both tactically and both sailing the boat, to, uh, to get us out of there and in good shape. Fate also favoured Ericsson 4 as they negotiated the tropical storms lying between the fleet and Cochin. Not every cloud here has a silver lining, but Torben Grail's men found the one that had. Set ourselves up in a good position and then we had, you know, you'll call it luck, um, pretty good ride with, I mean, literally one particular cloud which gave us a, like a 15 mile lead and, and it's funny in that doldrumy conditions how a little bit can really stretch out. I hate to say it, but luck, a lot of luck involved in it. In leg two, Ericsson 4 rode their luck better than anyone and 14 days after leaving Cape Town, sailed into Cochin unchallenged notching their second successive victory and becoming the first Volvo ocean race boat to make landfall in Asia. Oh, I'm very relieved to get here in one piece ahead and uh, great to see the family. It's good, it's had a bit of everything this leg. A lot of fast downwind stuff straight out of Cape Town, which is pretty exciting, pretty hairy, and then a lot of tactical decisions about where to go to the gate. And then we've been all the way up through the Indian Ocean, every transition and level and doldrums and double doldrums. And so it's been a, been a lot on, but it's been good. And right at the end, um, very quiet air to just try and make sure we got first. So I'm really happy with that. Next to arrive some 13 hours later were Telefonica Blue, relieved but also aware their broken dagger board had deprived them of a head-to-head -head light air battle with the race leaders. I think if 
definitely have gone a further easily position. I think it would have been very close to Ericsson 4 at their stage. And I think how the collision would have been, I think we would have a good crack at them to sail actually away from them. So that's always that crystal ball. You don't know what's going to happen. And uh, so we had our second place in Kochi, which was a good result. And, and that's it. That's history. Yeah. Ericsson 3 grabbed third. But the biggest welcome was reserved for Team Russia's arrival two days later. Delayed by navigational blunders and a run-in with a fishing net, they reached the dock halfway through the opening of the race village to a warmth and enthusiasm that characterized the whole stopover. Leg three promised a hard upwind slog across the Bay of Bengal, followed by a tortuous traverse of the Straits of Malacca. With two leg wins out of two, Ericsson looked dominant, but would their consistency make for complacency? Nah, not really. In fact, it's the opposite. It actually puts more pressure on you, and uh, with it being a lot lighter, we weren't 100% sure on how we were going to stack up and uh, performance-wise. Yeah, we went into the leg saying, right, there's not going to be any heavy running. We know we should be fast in these conditions. We know we'll go, go right up when so really we don't have any excuse to lose. To help read the bewildering wind shifts en route to the scoring gate at Pulau Wee, Bauer Beckin brought in meteorologist Tom Addis, whose analysis of sea and land breezes later in the leg would prove even more valuable. It's a matter of getting the bow into the brace first, and uh, then we'll be off. Tom Addis, uh, he's been working for us through all the homework for all the new legs. We know Tom very well. He's a navigator, class navigator himself. Coming here into the Strait of uh, Malacca, he's just having so much knowledge about coastlines, and we thought that could be a huge plus, and, and it paid off because he was just tremendous in that sense. He could predict mile by mile where the wind was coming from, and that's just something magic what you don't get very often to see. Pressure on navigators was intense. The tides and currents off Sri Lanka just one of the early pitfalls. So we were sailing in a three knot current trying to get around the uh, pirate exclusion zone and we couldn't get around the mark. We were sailing downwind as fast as the current was pushing us upwind. So we just sat there in one spot for six or seven hours. And meanwhile, everyone else is sailing east towards uh, the Malacca Strait. And that was gut wrenching to say the least. Worse followed for Delta Lloyd when structural failures around a keel ram extinguished all hope of catching any of the seven boats in front of them and delayed their arrival in Singapore even further. Matt Gregory from the Delta Lloyd. And then on top of it, people had plane flights to go back home to see family, girlfriends were coming into town. We hadn't had a vacation in three months or a single day off really for three months. So. You know, you want to tell them, yeah, you're going to make your flight and your girlfriend's not going to have to wait for three, four days for you to get in. That part of it was just horrible. We, are, we have to dive. Look at this. We have to dive. Okay, you tell me. You tell me. It's your call. You are the navigator. I don't know. On Telefonica Black, even six-race veteran Roger Nilsson was feeling the heat, missing a waypoint before fortunately realizing his mistake. All these boats I don't care what we have to do. I don't care. Vamos a mirar. The tactical trio on Telefonica Blue took the boat boldly south, but when the wind shift they'd envisaged failed to materialize, it was Ericsson 4 who bagged the maximum points at the scoring gate. Two days later, Grail's lead evaporated in the debris strewn waters and congested shipping lanes of the Straits of Malacca a supreme test of the fleet's verve and vigilance. One day we were sailing with six knots and suddenly we got stuck with a, a fleet of cargo ships coming straight on to us and it was like, oh my God, we are here in the, in the middle of the channel and we cannot move. <laughs> and all of a sudden somebody goes, there's a tugboat on the bow and you got the, a massive overlapping sail so you can't see them head down, and I'm up on the bow looking at the jib, calling the jib trim. There's a barge too, and there's a cable hanging out back, and we missed the barge from me to you, and we had to bear way off, and the two Ericsson boats went from behind us to, to up on top of us. I'm just thinking, oh my god, all this work for a tug and barge to come out of the tug and barge from hell. With just over 200 miles to the finishing line, 
and in a rare error, Ericsson 4 strayed too far offshore. Further in, Telefonica Blue, Ericsson 3 and Puma played the fluctuating breezes more effectively and slid past to seize the lead and the initiative. For whatever reason, we ended up slightly offshore. I mean, we're talking four miles or something. We just literally got becalmed and we spent a day trying to, to head, head inland while uh, the guys ran down inside us with a, with a good land breeze. I thought they would have kicked the coast a little harder because especially a guy like Torven, who's been sailing, especially in his home country, uh, where very similar conditions and you know that the coast is paying off very good sometimes. So. A bit surprised, but I could, I could totally understand because they just wanted to be like in the middle and in between the finish and then we just slipped on the outside of them. Four boats now shared the same stretch of water, a rare opportunity to observe each other's crew dynamics at close quarters. Very close quarters. They are less than one boat length away. We had a crazy night, I think, I don't know how many cha sail changes, maybe 20. So me and my uh, mate up on the bow there, we were working as hard as we could, and all of a sudden there came a telephonic guy. And hey guys, hey! Come on, hey! hey! We had to do a crash dive, try to avoid them. And... Ready, Pepe? It was very close, we had to avoid a collision, so we shouted protest. We met uh, those guys that call uh, our, us uh, names when we were out there here at the dock, and they seem happy, so it's okay. Well, it's good. Yeah, like in the morning, we park up in a beach, so the people start to put the anchor down, and you could see them. And yeah, I have friends in Ericsson 3. You say, hey, James, put the kettle on, and <laughs> you know, things like that. Fighting the tides for every yard and each other for every breath of wind. The quartet converged on the finish line, Telefonica Blue holding a narrow lead. Then the breeze died for us to, to, to three, four knots, and the guys from the back just reeled us in, and, and we're like within half a mile again. So it's just like, what's going to happen now? Then we caught again a little breeze, the other guy stopped, he extended, and then we knew once we were around the corner, it was a nice breeze. You could see there was good pressure, and then we knew it's an easy ride home. The most dramatic, if not the very closest, finish in race history saw the first four boats cross the line inside 20 minutes. In first place and breaking Ericsson 4's stranglehold on the race were an ecstatic Telefonica Blue. It's very special getting over the line and finishing. And I think the whole crew have been under so much pressure for so long with three other boats breathing down your neck. And sometimes we've been first and other times we've been fourth. And Everywhere in between, I think, just crossing the line and, and knowing it's over and it's finished and it was job done, and it, was, uh, it was a very special moment. Second were Ken Reed's men on Puma. The perfect finish is you have no idea where the finish line in that race. That's the perfect finish. Oh. While the final podium place went to Ericsson 3, who held off Torben Grail's men by just 40 seconds to record a memorable and longed for victory over their sister ship. Knowing the conditions out there, they were very unlucky, really. But uh, I'm not going to complain about the result. <laughs> I certainly enjoyed it a lot. <laughs> but all of a sudden, hey, wow, these guys actually can make a mistake. So welcome back to the real world, Ericsson 4. Uh, we're happy that you're part of our, of our little mix-up in the middle of the fleet from time to time. And let's just see if we can do that a little more often. Torben Grail's points tally now stands at 35, four and a half ahead of Bauer Becking. Ken Reed is currently third, with a five-point lead over Anders Luander in fourth. While just ahead of Fernando Ecavari in fifth place is Ian Walker. Team Russia leave the race after scoring 10 and a half points, one and a half more than Delta Lloyd. Ericsson 4's position at the top of the leaderboard was until recently in jeopardy. At a hearing in Singapore, an international jury had to decide whether a section of the bow that was changed before the race started without informing the measurers constituted a breach of race rules. 
Torben Grail's men were cleared, but their sister ship was not so lucky. Ericsson 3 was docked one point for briefly entering an exclusion zone on leg three. A new year and a new chapter in the race is about to begin, but its old unpredictability remains. <laughs>